In October 1890, a curious volume went on sale in the bookstores of New York. Called How the Other Half Lives, it had been written by a 41-year-old Danish-born police reporter named Jacob Rees. It would change forever the way people thought about the city. Rees had come to New York in 1870, when he was just 21, with $40 in his pocket. The money soon ran out, and he had learned firsthand what immigrant life could be like in the sprawling metropolis. Homeless, often hungry, and out of work, he had drifted into the crime-infested world of the Five Points slum, dozing on the cold, filthy floors of police lodging houses. More than once, he considered killing himself. Eventually, he landed on his feet and managed to find work as a police reporter for the New York Tribune and spent the next 10 years exploring the densely crowded slums of the Lower East Side. The sights, he later said, gripped my heart until I felt that I must tell of them or burst. Determined to show the world what he had seen, Reese began publishing magazine articles, but they seemed to make no impression, he wrote. He thought of taking pictures, but the tenements were too dark for the photographs to come out. Then, in 1887, a breakthrough came with the invention of a new photographic device, a magnesium flash powder that flooded even the deepest shadow with a brilliant flash of light. Armed with the new apparatus, Reese and his assistants plunged into the five points. With their way illuminated by spasmodic flashes, as bright and brief as those of lightning itself, a mysterious party has lately been startling the town. Denizens of the dives, tramps and bummers in their lodgings, have marveled at the phenomenon. What they saw was three or four figures in the gloom a ghostly tripod, some weird and uncanny movements, the blinding flash, and then the patter of retreating footsteps, and the mysterious visitors were gone. The New York Sun, February 12th, 1888. They would go into places, especially at night, with the brand new flash powder attachment and surprise people, sleepers in these kind of collective sleeping rooms or drinkers in these rot gut saloons. The images Reese brought back brought wealthy and middle class New Yorkers face to face with a reality most had long sought to avoid. Their city, one of the wealthiest in the world, had become home to more than a million overworked and undernourished people, often living in conditions of unspeakable horror. He went everywhere, carrying his camera down obscure courtyards and back ways with names like Rag Picker's Row, Blind Man's Alley, and Bottle Alley. In a place called Bandit's Roost, he photographed a dozen men, all said to be wanted for murder. He was especially moved by the plight of the young, the ragged street Arabs who sold newspapers by day and slept in alleys by night. The child laborers, who often worked seven days a week in stifling factories and sweatshops. And the tens of thousands of abandoned and orphaned children, who had been left to fend for themselves. But what horrified him most was the unspeakable conditions in which so many New Yorkers were forced to live. You have a vast influx of new immigrant groups, so that whereas in 1860, it was essentially a city of um, small homes. By 1900, the most crowded neighborhoods in the world are in New York City, especially on the Lower East Side, but also in East Harlem. We have the rise of tenement housing, uh, which is really worse than anything that was ever seen in the United States. And it's probably about as bad as anything that's ever been put up uh, anywhere in the world. A tenement briefly defined is simply a building that concentrates as many people into as little space as possible uh, with the lowest overhead costs for the landlord. 
the tenements began sometime in the middle of the 19th century, and there were no laws governing the tenement. So it really stuffed people into six or seven floors of rickety walk-up, uh, jammed into as many rooms as possible, many of which were interior rooms with no light of any sort or air. I went up the dark stairs in one of those tenements, and there I trod upon a baby. It is the regular means of introduction in the old dark houses, but I was never able to get used to it. I photographed the baby, standing with its back against the public sink, in a pool of filth that overflowed on the floor. I do not marvel that one in five children in the rear tenement, into which the sunlight never comes, was killed by the house. It seems strange, rather, than any survived. Jacob Rees. Many of the tenements were life-threatening, uh, literally. Uh, that is to say that the threat of disease, uh, infectious bacterial diseases like dysentery, for example, uh, was always there, and, and uh, uh, epidemics could spread rapidly. Um, the high death rate, the high sickness rate. This was the reality for many, many hundreds of thousands, millions of New Yorkers in any given moment. Ill-fed and ill-clothed, packed into buildings with few sinks or toilets, and sometimes with no plumbing at all. Tenement dwellers were prey to every kind of disease. Diphtheria, influenza, typhoid, pneumonia. Worst of all was the disease called the White Plague, tuberculosis. Every year, 20,000 new cases were reported in the slums. Every year, 8,000 people died of the disease. July and August spell death to the army of little ones, whom the doctor's skill is powerless to save. Sleepless mothers walk the street in the gray of the early dawn, trying to stir a cooling breeze to fan the brow of the sick baby. There is no sadder sight than this patient devotion against fearfully hopeless odds. Little coffins are stacked mountains of the charity commissioner's boat when it makes its semi-weekly trip to the city cemetery. Jacob Rees. How the Other Half Lives awakened New Yorkers to the condition of the poor as nothing else had. It was a new way of seeing the world, a modern way. And Reese used it not only to underscore his outrage, but to spur people to action. The slums were not inevitable, he insisted. They had been built by men and women, and men and women could change them. One of the things that, that Reese is trying to do in this book, I think, is to get away from um, some of the older Victorian notions of, of poverty. Why are some people poor? Why do some people live in such, in such terrible conditions? And his answer is, is more along the lines of, of a modern sort of environmental view of poverty. What he's basically arguing is that um, if people are going to live in these terrible tenements, if people are going to be deprived of the basics of light and air, uh, decency, we can't be surprised if these people become criminals or depraved or alcoholics or, or what have you. So that there's a way in which Reese is, I think, the opening shot, if you will, or, or uh, you know, the first chapter uh, in a reformed tradition. Because it was a book that made a lot of people uh, want to get involved in improving life in the city. Not long after the book was published, New York's energetic young civil service commissioner, Theodore Roosevelt, called on Reese at his office on Printing House Square. The writer was out, but Roosevelt left his calling card with a note on the back. I have read your book, it said, and I have come to help. <laughs> 